Before this episode begins, I want to give a shout out to all of you who went to tropicalmba.com slash survey and let us know your thoughts on the future of this pod. Boss man, have you seen there's the respondents are just coming in? Have you looked at this? I just looked at the prizes. <laughs> let's, if let's, you fill it out, you get prizes. That's what I was interested not in. Not everybody gets a prize, but lucky winners would potentially get a prize. And let me just list off some of the potential prizes. Digital marketing training courses from ClickMinded, financial services and coaching from the Bean Ninjas, water-resistant travel backpacks and accessories from Minal, business brokerage services from the Empire Flippers, AppSumo store credits, free membership to Skillshare, free prints from today's guest, Cat Coke. I'm not even done yet. Two premium sleep masks from Manta Sleep and two matching custom hats from Authentic Leather patch code that's a this is why i filled it out am you, i allowed to fill it out because <laughs> i did check it out this is your last week to fill out the tmba survey we appreciate it and thanks to those wonderful companies too for donating these prizes on behalf of this survey we appreciate it we appreciate your thoughts check it out the last week for you to enter tropicalmba.com slash survey Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Welcome back to the pod, boss man. We are back in the office. Yo. In order to be more creative, which is the topic of today's show. 45 minutes later, that's how long it takes me to get to the office, but I appreciate it. The creativity is exploding. Today's show is about something I've always been fascinated by. In some ways, I've always been attracted more to artists and creative people than I was by growing up who I thought of business people. You know what I mean? As entrepreneurs, fundamentally, what we do is we build and create things that are our own Our first business was based on the designs you created in art school, Ian. We're both advocates and fans of thin cigarettes. Now, if you're under 21, (laughs) if you're under 21, don't smoke, but... Thin cigarettes, you mean art school? Yeah, art school, thin cigarettes, uh, turtlenecks, you know, things like that. Well, anyway, Ian, I definitely know the creative streak is strong in this audience, and capitalizing on your creativity is what today's episode is all about. I love creating art. I love painting and I love creating digital illustrations, but I also really like the strategy and business side of things. So having that mutual fulfillment with both the creative and the strategic and business side of things, I think has worked out very well for me. Today's guest has gone from working the nine to five, partially while living in her childhood bedroom in her parents' house in Kansas in order to pay down student debt. Respect. Pause the episode. Respect. Super respect. Respect. Right now, if you're in a twin bed and it has a car print or some trolls on it or whatever it might have, like you're on the right path. You're on the right path. She has transformed her lifestyle through her creativity to traveling the world on her own terms, having incredible success, working with some amazing brands. I mean, what today's guest has done is really, really special. It was fantastic to hear about it. I hope that it inspires all you creative types out there. You know, back in the old days, Ian. When you think about making money from your art, you'd think it's either you're a sellout or you're serious. And I think the internet has done amazing things for creative people. First off, you can't so successfully just retreat to your cabin and convince yourself that really you're a misunderstood genius. Now you have the opportunity to put your creativity in front of people and really see if it resonates with them. Never been a better time. I say to be a writer, an artist, any of these creative pursuits, like this is the best time in history to be living and famous for your artwork. (laughs) You used to have to die and then you got famous. Now you can be famous and be living making artwork. Today's guest is getting famous. And because of that, she's recently decided to partner with an agency to do a lot of the business part of it, which I found really fascinating. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to really dig into how she got so much exposure for her art and ultimately has been making a great living for herself out of her creativity 
and unique vision. So I love this one, Ian. Let's roll it and we'll be back after the conversation with some comments. My name is Kat Cocolette, and I'm an illustrator and designer, and my career is basically licensing my artwork and designs through companies like Target, Urban Outfitters, Bed Bath & Beyond, and they use my designs to create products and then sell them to their customers. Do you consider yourself to be an entrepreneur? I do, but it took me a while to get there. For a while, I thought I was a freelancer, and then I sort of embraced being an artist, and Eventually, I got to the point where I realized, you know, what I'm doing is essentially being an entrepreneur. Can you give us a scale of your business just to give the audience a sense for the scale you're operating at? Yeah, sure. So I have zero employees. It's kind of the solopreneur journey and the revenue coming in is in the low six figures. Why don't you have any employees, by the way? I'm assuming you must work with people. I work with people, but... I've always kind of, I've shied away from taking anyone on as staff because I, you know, one thing I really value is this personal autonomy, both over my time and my income. And I've been able to make this work by myself so far without having to build a team around me. It's tricky because I know I could scale much more efficiently and quickly if I did build up a team, but I also really value my personal time and you know, being able to take a week off if I want to take a week off and go, you know, hiking through northern Vietnam without being personally accountable and responsible to a team around me. It's been one of my struggles for the past few years is trying to decide, you know, is this the right time to scale? And is it possible to scale when it's still just me? Or is it time to start thinking about bringing on additional people? Actually, last year, I signed on with an art agency and it's basically a team that represents me and they do everything that I was, you know, either bad at doing or I had no interest in doing previously, which was, you know, reaching new clients, new companies that I could start licensing my artwork through. They represent my work at trade shows. They manage all of my contracts in a way that's much more organized than I was doing before. So it's almost like an athlete or a singer would have an agency representing them. Is it a similar model? Yeah, it's, it's almost the exact same business model. Oh, interesting. So did you approach them or? They approached me. I'd been looking for an agency. I'd been doing some research for, you know, about a year and a half, but I never really pulled the trigger on anything. And last summer when I was in Serbia, this agency sent me an email and they wanted to jump on a call. And I was already familiar with them, the work they'd done, the artists that they represented currently. And I was pretty excited about it. We jumped on a call and it sounded like it was going to be a great fit. So, you know, after. I don't know, 20 back and forths on revising our contract, we finally got to a place that made sense for both of us and was really mutually beneficial. So I've been rolling with them for about six months now. It's interesting because like my perception of what you're up to, because you're one of my favorite Instagram follows, because everything you're doing looks banging, <laughs> like your work, like your life, all the places you visit constantly. I was imagining like you sustaining that level of income while living that lifestyle, to me, my first thought was, if you don't have somebody managing it, you would be super stressed out. It was pretty stressful before I had this team managing all of my contracts and new work opportunities for me because it was entirely on me. So if I did, you know, I mentioned before, if I take, you know, 10 days off to go hiking in northern Vietnam, and I miss a really important email, maybe it's target emailing me. And if I would have missed that, that opportunity could have potentially been blown. It feels like they've got my back at all times, which is great. And, you know, everything that I push for in a contract with a new client, higher royalty rates, limited exclusivity, those are things that's also beneficial for them. You know, what's beneficial for me is also beneficial for them. So it's, it's a really great relationship where I know they've got my best interests at heart. And what percentage would you have to pay typically an agency like that to represent you? It's a 50-50 split. And do you feel like you make your money back on that deal? With the amount of new work that they brought in for me since I signed on with them six months ago, it's been a really great deal on my end. Can you describe where you are in the world right now? Right now, I am in Tbilisi, Georgia. I got here about two weeks ago, and I'll be here for the rest of the month. I just wanted to test out kind of this part of the world. I'm living here in an apartment with some friends. 
It's a pretty good digital nomad hotspot. There's a lot of co-working spaces, cafes that have great Wi-Fi. It's a very walkable city. Before we go back to your story, Kat, you know, this is an audio show and most of what you do is really visual. Could you maybe paint a picture for the audience about your work and what it looks like? I guess the artwork that I license primarily is one of two categories. It's either hand-painted artwork, so it's watercolor, illustrations, gouache, acrylic, India ink, things that I paint by hand, scan into my computer, and then digitize and send to clients, or it's illustrations that I create digitally, so it's a lot of vector art. And the illustrations and paintings that I create are based off of the things that I see on my travels. So I live as a digital nomad. My home changes, you know, almost on a monthly basis. So while I'm traveling around, I take photos of the interesting things around me that inspire me, whether it's palm leaves in Thailand or a bathhouse I just visited here in Georgia a couple days ago. And then I illustrate them in kind of this signature cat coke style that I've got going for me. What is that style? It's a lot of saturated colors, white space, and then I take complicated motifs and I really look for opportunities to simplify them and flatten them so that they feel more stylized. What's an example of that? Like what would be a complicated motif? I went to the sulfur baths in Budapest last summer and the architecture there was just absolutely stunning. So I took, you know, a million photos in and around those hot springs and sulfur baths. And then what I did is I created a digital vector illustration of one of the facades of those buildings. So it's, you know, it's a really limited color palette, two colors. The architecture is very flattened and it uses really simplified shapes. You can tell what it is when you look at it, but it's a very kind of modern aesthetic of that architecture. How do these things become commercially relevant? Because it doesn't, like that connection isn't clear to me. It's really hit or miss. So about, I would say, 10% of my overall portfolio earns me probably 90% of my licensing income. So I do a lot of trend tracking. I look at you know what's on the runway. I can apply those color palettes that you might see in vogue to the illustrations that I'm doing. I read a lot of blogs. I see design trends that are happening. I follow home decor websites, and I see what you know these interior decorators are making. And you know, you can find patterns in a lot of these aspects and then piece them together and find a way that it can apply to what I'm doing, which is surface design, essentially. A lot of it is pattern making. So if you are, you know, plastering your walls with wallpaper, that pattern is surface design. If you're buying a, you know, duvet cover or a rug or a pillow from anthropology, whatever pattern is on that, you know, an artist created that pattern and that's what surface design is. And that's essentially what I do. So are there then like product managers at Target or X company that creates these sorts of products looking for people like you? Basically, the way that my company got started and the way that I ran it for the past four years is I did very little outreach. Instead, I had a strong social media presence so brands would find me. So Target, Urban Outfitters, Home Goods, these were all companies that reached out to me to see if I was interested in licensing some of my designs for products that they wanted to sell through their stores. Wow. You know, a lot of people say if you live like a digital nomad, it's really hard to be productive. But in my early career as a digital nomad, I was trying to write about it. Like that was my creative outlet. And I found it to be the exact opposite, that there was a kind of a combination of factors. One is that it was very hard for me to do outreach and get on the phone with people. So I just didn't because I was always in these weird places with horrible Wi-Fi. So instead, I focused all my energy on writing about the experiences. And I found it to be really, really productive. And now when I'm sort of back in the United States, I find myself just on the phone with everybody all the time. I resonate with that 100%. You know, while I'm traveling and Moving from one place to another, I can't always rely on being able to jump on a call with someone, but I always travel with my art supplies with me so I can, you know, pull out my watercolor paper, some paints and paint on a whim wherever I am and whenever that inspiration strikes. So even if I don't have all of the materials I need, like a digital scanner and my laptop, I'll always have my art supplies so I can store those paintings, wait till I'm back in a place where I have my computer and the rest of my supplies, scan it in, digitize it and send it out. But I just spent the past 10 days on a little island in the Mediterranean called Stromboli. It's off the coast of Sicily. 
And while I was there, I wasn't doing a lot of emails and calls, but I was painting every day. So now that I'm kind of in this stable place with great Wi-Fi and an apartment in Georgia, I've been、um, periodically pulling those paintings out, scanning them in, digitizing them, editing them, and doing kind of all of that, you know, process work before I send it off to clients to be licensed. But Yeah, it was it was one of those situations where I was incredibly inspired, so I took advantage of that inspiration and had a lot of creative output, and、um, it really paid off. I want to underline it because it's something that we don't talk a lot about on the show. We talk more about you know hustle and what to do with clients and how to land a proposal or whatever. But for me, I always thought the strategy that I'm hearing you suggest was always really the sneaky, more powerful one, which is sort of put yourself in a room and, and assuming you're onto something. Build your asset because at the end of the day, you know your portfolio is going to be stronger than the combination of forty phone calls you made over the course of a few weeks. Absolutely, and the one thing in my job that I do very well is paint. You know, that's the one unique thing that I can bring to the table that a lot of other people can't. Yeah, I can negotiate contracts back and forth, but there's someone that can do that much better than me. So. You know, in my mind, it's focus on the things that I'm best at and the things that are unique and that I can't necessarily outsource. Really push those hard, and of course, you know, there's a thousand little things that I also have to do when I'm running my company. You know, it's those emails, it's new proposals, it's contracts, it's social media. But as long as I kind of keep that one mission in line, which is create create artwork that's going to be licensed out, that's been my most successful strategy. It seems to me that. Your social circle, your friends, are a bunch of entrepreneurs and business people. Why don't you hang out with a bunch of artists? I haven't found a lot of artists that are doing what I'm doing, which is this digital nomad lifestyle and traveling around. I'll definitely meet artists when I go to different places in different cities, but for the most part, they're established in that area. Okay, so you don't have any like gripe against the artist community. I used to be a musician and. When I learned about business, it really changed the way I looked at the music community, because I thought that like so many of the self beliefs that they had about what they were doing with their music and their band and their lives were really self destructive. That if they were to combine their creative drive with the things that entrepreneurs were learning about making it sustainable and making a living out of it, they would enjoy it at the end of the day more. But it didn't seem like they were willing to. I mean, in the music community, they would call it selling out. Selling out is—it's the same term in the art community. You know, what I'm doing is commercial illustration, which is a complete sellout. You know, in the eyes of fine artists, I have fine artist friends, and we get along with each other. But yeah, there's definitely kind of a difference in the reason we produce art and and how we kind of go about that. And for me, it's it's a business. And for some of my fine artist friends, it's more about a form of expression and and you know just art for the sake of art. It's interesting though when I look at your portfolio, it doesn't feel like I'm looking at a business. Feeling like I'm looking at some art that the creator is really passionate about. Well, I am passionate about it for sure, but I'm also painting things that I know are going to sell well, or at least I hope they do. So I look at you know what's what's going to be trending in this next season and and kind of paint along those lines because you know I'll I'll do paintings just for fun that I have no intention of. Monetizing, or I, I don't have high expectations for, and that's definitely a percentage of you know what I'm painting and putting out there. I am, after all, an artist. What I do, commercial artwork. My number one goal as I'm painting is: is this going to appeal to an audience and sell? I look at what you're doing, and I know other people do as well, and they think that's the ticket. Like you have absolutely created what every artist ultimately dreams of, which is. You're able to sustain yourself comfortably by being a creative full time. Do you see it that way? I feel pretty lucky. I'm really grateful for this, you know, career and lifestyle that I've been able to carve out for myself. It's not because I'm the best artist in the world, and it's not because I'm the best businesswoman in the world. A lot of it was timing. I got in at the right time with with certain companies. And things began to snowball from there. But it's also, you know, I, I love creating art. I love painting, and I love creating digital illustrations. But I also really like the strategy and business side of things. So having that mutual fulfillment with both the creative and the strategic and business side of things, I think, has worked out very well for me. So back in 2014, I 
uploaded my first painting to a print on demand website called Society Six. And that was really the right place, the right time for me because they were, you know, they were an established company. I put one painting on there because I was really just looking for a way to make, if I could make an extra couple hundred bucks a month, my life would be changed. You know, at that point, I was working as an art director at an agency. I wasn't completely satisfied with my salary. I was spending more than I was making. And I was at a point where I was watching my bank account, you know, get lower and lower every month, which has this immense amount of stress attached to it. So I was looking for ways that I could earn some money on the side. And while I worked at that agency, they had a very strict no freelance policy. So I couldn't use my graphic design skills to earn extra money. So I I was already coming home from work every day and painting. It was just my way to unwind after work. So I thought, what if I can find a way to monetize these paintings? That kind of turned into me taking photos of the paintings that I was doing and publishing them on Instagram. And, you know, before too long, my followers went from a couple hundred friends and family members to several thousand fans, which was was kind of weird. (laughs) But people began commenting and asking where they could purchase my work, if they could buy originals where they could find it. And that was, you know, I never had the idea of monetizing my artwork. It was it was this this audience on social media that did. They were the ones that were kind of prodding me in that direction and sparked the idea in my mind of maybe this is something that I could monetize. So at that point, kind of my mindset went from coming home and painting because I wanted to unwind to coming home and painting because maybe it's something that I could make a little bit of side cash from. So I looked into how to price my original pieces, how to ship it, how to find customers. And it just got a little bit overwhelming. And then I stumbled upon um, Society6, which was a, well, it is a website where you can go buy cool phone cases, art prints for your home, apparel, home decor items, things like that. You can go to their website, look at all the thumbnails and mock-ups of the pieces. Say you buy a phone case, Society6 will print the artwork on that phone case, ship it out to the customer, and then give the artist that designed that a cut, a percentage, a royalty of those sales. So I found that it was a really low risk opportunity on my end. You know, the only risk was time. And I already had, you know, a stack of paintings that I just created, well, you know, in the past year that I started scanning in. And again, it was right place, right time, because within a few months, you know, my Society6 shop really started to blow up. That first month, I sold a t-shirt and a couple phone cases, and I made about $9. And I wasn't discouraged by that. I never really occurred to me that people would actually want to purchase my illustrations. So by someone buying a t-shirt and those two phone cases, it, it kind of broke that limited mindset. And I realized that maybe this is something that I could monetize. Fast forward to the sixth month, I was pulling in about $5,000 that month. I had sold just uh, shy of a thousand items. And at that point, you know, I was making more through this one website, Society6, than I was at my nine to five job. I mean, that was a big mental shift where I realized that this is something that I should be pursuing more heavily. I still remember the first time someone sent me money for something I created. And it wasn't a lot of money. And it, it's, for me, it was like a complete revolution in my brain. This idea that you don't have to like apply to stuff to get paid. Absolutely. If anything, that first month of selling three items, I mean, that was more of a game changer than month six, where I was pulling in almost 5k. You know, in my mind, I'd always separated being a fine artist with being a designer. You know, I went to school to be a designer. And that's what I had built my career on. That's what I thought my entire career was going to be based off of. And then all of a sudden I found out that, you know, maybe maybe I should embrace this whole this whole artist side of me. Did your boss know about this? Yeah, they they knew about it. When things started picking up for me on Society Six, I started promoting my um, my artwork more heavily on social media. Yeah, they knew that this was something I was doing on the side. Do you think they were conflicted about it? Because it's pretty close to it kind of looks like freelancing a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, it was, there was a little bit conflicting and it got to a point where I realized that I I really couldn't do both at once. It wasn't fair to, you know, I was spending at that point, maybe 20 hours a week on my side hustle in addition to 40 at my regular job. I basically wasn't sleeping. I was working all the time. I had no break. 
And so it definitely got to um, a complete breaking point where I realized I, I can't continue doing both of these. It's not fair to me and it wasn't fair to my employers. So the first 5K month you had was sometime in mid-2014? Yeah, it was in 2014. And you got your job in 2011, 2012 range? Yes, in 2011. Do you mind sharing, and you don't have to, do you mind sharing how much you were getting paid as a designer and illustrator? My starting salary was $32,000 a year. And I made a little bit more by the time I left. I was in the low 60s. But even at that point, I'd gotten that raise just a few months before I ended up quitting. So yeah, at that point, I was earning significantly more on the side than I was at my nine to five. It's interesting because, you know, especially it feels to me in the creative fields, this is really common where as a young professional, like the way the, say, system is set up, you're sort of expected to burn your first few years. You know, like I was in the same situation where I was just happy to have a job and it wasn't covering all my expenses or it was just barely. And this just seems like how it's the setup goes. Yeah. I mean, my first almost year and a half of working at that job, I still lived at my parents' house because I was still paying off student loans. You know, thanks mom and dad. They let me move into my childhood bedroom while I kind of got that sorted out until I got all my loans paid off. And then even at that point when I moved out, I was still, I felt like I was just scraping by. Take me to the conversation that you had with your boss when you quit. I think they knew it was coming. You know, at that point I'd been, you know, doing this licensing thing on the side for for quite a bit. And I don't think they were that surprised, but it was still a pretty sad goodbye because I wasn't just saying goodbye to this agency that I absolutely loved working at. I was also saying goodbye to this career path that I always thought was going to be my career path for life. So when I when I quit that job, I was also quitting being an art director, being a designer and working in that industry. At least that's the way it felt at the time. You know, looking back, you know, no decision is ever permanent. If the licensing thing didn't work out, I could always get another job in that same industry. But at the time, it felt like this big monumental shift. But yeah, my my bosses were really supportive of it. They Were you nervous? I was so nervous. I invited my boss out to lunch and, you know, for Probably days prior, I'd just been practicing in front of the mirror of what I was going to say and how I was going to break it to them. In my mind, I, I just thought it was it was an ultimate act of betrayal. You know, we I had no problems working with them. It was great. I loved that relationship. It just, you know, what it came down to was I had this opportunity on the side that was something I wanted to pursue. But yeah, they were they were really supportive. I mean, I definitely started crying when I told them I was leaving, and it was a pretty sad moment. But yeah, they were nothing but supportive. So it was, you know, it was a really, really great experience for me. Hey, yo, today's show is sponsored by Revision Legal. These are lawyers who understand what we're all about here at the pod. If you got a legal problem, even if you don't have a legal problem, get ahead of it and give the team at Revision Legal a call. Revision Legal is a firm that truly understands entrepreneurs and internet business. They don't think Amazon products are about logging and timber. That's right. Revision Legal really understands entrepreneurs because they're part of the community and they're around them all the time. So the unique challenges and questions that you face, they're equipped to help you address them, whether it's combining assets and forming a new joint venture, protecting your brand through trademark registration, Amazon FBA products through patent protection, or just trying to buy and sell digital assets. Revision Legal has your back because it focuses on online companies just like yours. Their attorneys listen to your goals, your pain points, take the time to understand your business, and then create a plan personalized for you. So look, legal questions and dilemmas come in many shapes and sizes. Don't let them keep you up at night. Give the team at Revision Legal a call and get it sorted out before the stuff bites you in the butt. So check out the team over at revisionlegal.com and don't hesitate to drop them a line if you're seeking advice or help. So you end up on the other side of this difficult conversation with this incredible income stream from your art and no 
job. So how do you respond to this? I was so excited when this happened to me that I got two speeding tickets within 20 minutes on the (laughs) California highway because I just couldn't pay attention to my speedometer. I understand that 100%. My impulsive decision was to book a plane ticket to Manila and spend the next six weeks backpacking through Southeast Asia because I, I had that freedom. You know, it was the first time in my entire life that I had financial independence plus time. You know, I could, all of a sudden I was in charge of my own time. I could do whatever I wanted and I could afford to do it. And that had never, ever happened before. So yeah, I definitely was pretty impulsive. I bought that ticket to Manila. I spent the next six weeks going through the Philippines. I went up through Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, And it was a fantastic trip. And, you know, by the time that I was flying back to the States, I realized that, you know, this wasn't really quenching my my wanderlust. The the whole point of the trip was I was supposed to, okay, I'm going to go have this crazy travel experience and then come back and then be serious and figure out how I'm going to make this career trajectory work. But instead, on my way back, I was like, I just want to do this more and more and more. And I started looking for opportunities that I could combine travel with running this art licensing business at the same time. What did those opportunities look like? You know, it was surprisingly easy. All of my clients are all through email and calls. I never see anyone in person that it really doesn't matter where in the world I am. As long as I'm able to create art, scan it into my computer, digitize it and send it out to clients, that's really all I need to do my job. So it started by I packed up all my art supplies into my car and I drove out to Colorado trying to figure out if there was a place there that I wanted to unpack, find an apartment and live. But one thing I realized was, you know, the first week or two weeks in any new place was my absolute favorite time. So working as I'm traveling through Colorado is actually surprisingly easy. I could make this exact same thing work if I just go back to Thailand on the other side of the world. I'd already been there during my backpacking trip. I had gone through Chiang Mai, which I absolutely loved. And I decided that it was really no different what I was doing, you know, working from Airbnbs and coffee shops in Colorado than it would be doing the exact same thing in Thailand. I feel like in Thailand, it's a lot easier to make friends that are kind of on that same trajectory in life. People that prioritize the same things, which is entrepreneurship, independence, travel. And I feel like it wasn't until I got to Chiang Mai that I felt like I really, truly found that tribe of people. You know, even as I was working in coffee shops in Kansas City or Colorado, I wasn't really meeting that many people that were running their businesses or had prioritized, you know, travel the same way I had. But all of a sudden you get to Chiang Mai and it's, you know, it's a a city of transplants. It's people from all over the world that are coming to focus on one thing or another. But one thing we all have in common is we don't, we don't know anyone. So there were a lot of opportunities to quickly make friends and really be immersed in this community of, of, you know, digital nomads and entrepreneurs. So let's talk about like how you ran your business at this time. I mean, did you have goals set for yourself? You're working alone. So how did, how do you organize your day? How do you stay productive? Like what was your thought in terms of like, what am I doing here in terms of the business side? So I I mentioned before that I was selling through Society6, and they're the ones that got up to about 5K a month by month six. So things were going really well with them. But the best part was that my agreement with them was a non-exclusive, which meant the same designs and artwork that I was selling through their company, I could sell through anyone else without violating any contracts. My priority at that point in my career was find as many of these kind of companies as possible. What other companies can I have this non-exclusive license with where I can sell my designs on a print-on-demand basis? So I, I looked at, you know, Redbubble, Casetify, Drawdeck, you know, there's there's a bunch of others. And I started opening up shops with those websites as well, driving my social media traffic there to get things kicked off. And then, you know, once it gets to a certain point, those companies do a lot of self-marketing for me. If they see that one of my pieces is selling well because I've driven my audience there, at some point, they're going to start marketing that themselves. It'll appear you know, on the front of their homepage or on their newsletters or even in their marketing catalogs. So my strategy at that point was just find, you know, it was a shotgun approach, find as many companies as I can that I can sell my artwork through on a non-exclusive basis, get my artwork uploaded through those companies, and then see which ones take off, which ones have potential, and then which ones were kind of duds. So it was a lot of experimenting. 
And then I was also at that point looking for opportunities to license with in-store retailers. You know, these are the companies like Target, Urban Outfitters, Home Goods. But the only problem was I wasn't, I had no idea how to get an in with them. You know, I tried stalking them on LinkedIn and sending emails. I did a lot of research and just a lot of cold calling, but really none of it paid off. But what did work for that was just, it was luck. It was them reaching out to me. So thanks to this, you know, social media presence. And because my artwork was all over the internet at this point through all these different companies, it was easy for them to track back, find my information and send me emails. So like, Urban Outfitters emailed me. It was actually right before I was on a flight to Tokyo. And I got the email, I looked at it, and they were interested in licensing one of my pieces for their home decor collection. How did you feel when you opened that email? Oh my God. I started jumping up and down and I was in, I was in the security line. It was, it was completely inappropriate, but I was so jazzed because I, I mean, they were on my, they were on my list for ages. I'd always wanted to have my stuff sold through Urban Outfitters. And all of a sudden this opportunity just arose and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't respond back to them. I didn't have enough time. And the whole flight, you know, I was kind of finessing my email back to them and waiting until I got Wi-Fi again to send. But um, yeah, it was an incredible feeling, but it was also, it was also luck because, you know, all of that outreach that I'd done on my end, it, it was just on deaf ears. It literally had to be them finding me and reaching out before that partnership was solidified. These big brands are typically a total pain in the butt to work with. Has that been your experience? Or this is the the word on the street that I've heard, especially through product companies. How do you feel about that? You know, working with big companies like this, like Target, Urban Outfitters, it's actually very streamlined. You know, they, they work with licensors all the time. So there's not a lot of you know, this back and forth that sometimes happens when I work with comp- like product companies that are brand new and launching a brand new collection that have never worked with licensors before. Sure, the margins are definitely lower, but just by products and, you know, inventory alone, I'll be making that money and then some. So in your approach of going out there and just getting as much coverage as you could, were there any surprising points of leverage, like things that ultimately had a big impact that you might not have thought beforehand? You know, when I first started doing these one-on-one contracts with companies, especially some of the smaller ones, I I really wasn't sure how to price myself and what a fair royalty rate was. You know, industry average is about 10%. And I know that now, but at the time, I really wasn't sure. And I was thinking, oh, my my artwork, that should be probably 50, 75% royalty, which, you know, fiscally makes absolutely no sense on their end. You know, they're the (laughs) ones creating inventory and shipping it out. But in my mind, I was like, oh, that, that, that sounds about fair. So I was asking for things in contracts and writing things in being like, okay, I want 50% royalty. I, I need like 25 shout outs on Instagram. I want to have, you know, some shout outs in your email newsletter. If you have a big list, homepage, all, all of that stuff. So I was just, you know, I was asking for the absolute moon and, you know, they, they would come back to me and they'd be like, well, we're not going to do a 50% royalty, but we will do 15 and we'll give you five shout outs on Instagram and we'll include you in our email. So, you know, these are things that I never would have gotten if I wouldn't have asked for it. And the only reason I asked for it was because I didn't know, you know, what was appropriate to ask for and what wasn't. So that naivety almost, you know, it really did benefit me. You know, I've never entered into a licensing agreement. So maybe we could do a mock one here. Like, say I wanted to make a Tropical MBA podcast t-shirt and you would be willing to make the illustration for it. So I go to you and say, hey, Kat, I'm willing, you know, we're a small company, so I'll offer you 17% royalties and we'll shout you out on Instagram as the person who designed the t-shirt. Do you then have to trust me that I'm going to keep a tally of how many of those t-shirts get sold in order to pay you accurately? Absolutely. So that trust is a huge part of deciding who I want to work with. You know, that's ultimately what it comes down to is I get sales reports and if they, you know, if someone tells me they sold, you know, 2,500 items, I have to just believe them and that it wasn't, you know, secretly 5,000 and they just want to jit me on sales. Because that's huge numbers. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, it's enormous. The, the, The incentive seems so in line with them to try to cheat you. That's why it's so tricky to kind of pick companies and brands that I really trust working with. And, you know, that's just part of the, I guess that's part of the gamble of it as well. So in terms of trust, is that a feeling or are there things that you look for? It's both. If it's a new company that's just off the ground, usually I'll give them a few designs off the bat. I'm not going to give them access to my entire portfolio, but maybe just a few and then I'll see how it goes. 
If it's a company that I haven't heard of before, but they've been around for a little bit, I'll look and see what other artists are selling their work through the same company. It's a pretty tight network of artists. Like we email each other all the time, the ones that are into licensing, just to double check on things. So, you know, I probably get an email, you know, once a week or so of another artist that's into licensing being like, oh, I saw you had designs up on, you know, daily objects. How are they to work with? Do they rip you off or is it okay? And then, you know, there's a lot of double checking back and forth within the art community for that. It feels like entrepreneurs could be a problem for you because you could easily imagine someone like you sending me a cool tropical MBA design and then me looking at the numbers and being like, ah, these are big checks to cat. So I'm going to go <laughs> to a designer online and have them create something that's pretty close. Has that situation ever happened to you? That situation has never happened. And Dan, I don't think you would do that. You're a nice guy. <laughs> 15% cat is a lot. <laughs> you know, I would trust that you would run the numbers before you agree to a percentage like that, you know, to make sure it makes sense on your end. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's another risk. I guess it makes sense that you're like in this world where like the companies, they're set up to do that, you know, whereas like an upstart company, you know, they don't understand what they're doing as much. Yeah. And, you know, back when I was a designer, one of the questions that we would always ask new clients before we signed on with them was, have you ever worked with creative before? And if it was a new company and they'd never, ever hired branding or creative or web design, any sort of creative work, we generally wouldn't work with them because it's just, if you haven't worked through that process before, it, it on my end, it would take twice as long. It's It goes kind of into that whole client education folder and it's just, it's much easier to work with someone that's already kind of been through the ropes on how licensing works. You've done something that is a lot of companies dream of happening to them, which is that celebrities have used and worn your designs. Can you talk about who those celebrities are and how that happened and what the impact was on your business? Yeah, the celebrity mentions have been absolutely phenomenal. The first one was Hillary Duff. And she actually worked with Casetify, which was one of the tech accessory companies that I licensed through. And so they partnered with Hillary Duff to do a Christmas collection. And so Hillary Duff selected, I don't know, five cell phone cases from the Casetify collection, and one of them was mine. And it was actually pretty cool. She took this really scandalous selfie in front of the mirror, and she had my cell phone case as her, her case design, and it was like all over E and, and like Entertainment Weekly, all this stuff. And I was like, yes, it was even on the Ellen show, you know, like showing that scandalous selfie. And it was my cell phone case. It was. Oh, that must have been so cool. That was a pretty great moment. It was amazing. We're going to have to post that photo on, <laughs> on this blog post. Did it affect your business? It only did when I promoted it. So the tricky thing there was because that that collection was through Casetify, everything that she promoted as, you know, as her deal for that collaboration, it was going through Casetify. So my brand name wasn't directly associated with that, which was that that was a huge missed opportunity. So, you know, for example, with them, they asked me later if I wanted to do a custom collection with anthropology. And one of my absolute goals in business is to have my design sold through anthropology. But the only problem was part of the contract was I couldn't have my brand name or my signature on any of those designs. It would only be branded as Casetify. So it was it was a really tough decision, but I had to turn them down on that because one day I hope that I can have my work sold through anthropology, but it's got to be on my terms. And having that brand recognition, I mean, in a sense, that's even more important than the income that that would bring in. Because that's your leverage in those exact negotiations, right? Exactly, exactly. Like brand association, I mean, that's that's huge. And that's how I get, you know, from A to B in this business. Are there other ways you preserve your brand like that? That's pretty fascinating. Another way is my signature must, I mean, my signature must always be included in pretty much everything that gets produced. So when I sign on new contracts with new clients, that's always written in there that they cannot crop off my signature. And it's it's a very legible it's my brand name, which is Cat Coke, C A T C O Q, because no one can pronounce or spell my last name, which is Cogolet. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's one way of doing it. And another way is just having this very recognizable style within my illustrations. People will tag me on Instagram all the time when, um, you know, like if a big brand or a big celebrity shares my work, just because if they, it's, it's recognizable, like it's this certain design style that I have that you can see 10 pieces and then see an 11th and realize that that fits in with that same collection. So that's actually how I find out about a lot of these 
celebrity mentions, like when Sarah Michelle Gellar was, you know, she had some of my pillows in her home and she posted a photo on Instagram. I don't follow her on Instagram, but a lot of my followers do. And as soon as she posted that, I just, you know, my Instagram account just blew up with notifications of everyone being like, oh, cat, look, it's your, it's your pillows. <laughs> and so a lot of, a lot of the way I find out about these things, same thing with Jessica Simpson and Khloe Kardashian and Lauren Conrad. It's people saw these celebrities posting this, these pieces. They knew that it was my work and then they tagged me. It's great that I'm getting all of these kind of like celebrity promotions, but the downside is the celebrities have no idea who designed their pillowcase. They just thought it was a cool pillowcase to have in their home. So I'm, I'm missing out on that potential mention. What's your dream now? What does the next step look like in a business like yours, in your mind? Worldwide art domination. Of course. <laughs> does that mean like, you know, brand allegiances, like this is the cat coke version of our like our whole line of summer wear or furniture or is, is those the sorts of deals that are next in line i hope so one day having a custom branded line you know sold through a specific store where it's an entire collection of my work on some sort of product or, or collection of products i mean that would that would definitely be a big next step for me one thing i was really nervous about when i was beginning this you know the very beginning stages of this career was because I had such poor skills at outreach and pretty much all of my new collaborations happened because they reached out to me. I worried that, you know, I had this capacity to really reach this massive audience, but I just didn't know how to reach the brands to reach that audience. And that's one thing that I'm really hoping to remedy by signing on with this agency. Not only do they manage my contracts for me, but they're going out on my behalf and finding new opportunities. So we have a really transparent relationship where I can let them know exactly what I'm looking for and the types of brands that I want to be associated with. And they can go out on my behalf and, and pitch for those opportunities. Part of it is a little bit out of my hands, but that's also pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it's an interesting strategy because a lot of people would say, you know, they'll come up to you and say, oh my gosh, there's so much potential. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. But there's another philosophy which says you're gaining momentum, you're gaining brand equity. These things take time, like stay in your tool shed and continue to grow the way you've been growing. And eventually one of these deals is bound to hit. Does that sound like a naive strategy? No, I mean, it's a lot of it with, you know, with brand recognition, it really can be a, a pretty slow grow. And, you know, I've been cultivating this, this Cat Coke brand for the past five years now, and it's I never thought that I would be where I am today. So I think that that really is a huge part of it. And a lot of it is being selective about the brands that I do decide to work with. Because, you know, just as much as I want to work with anthropology, there's also brand associations I don't want to have. I had an opportunity to license some of my illustrations through Walmart a couple of years ago. But the illustration that they wanted to license at that time was my absolute top seller through all of these other channels. It was a watercolor collection of alpacas. And, you know, if Walmart would have wanted one of my pieces that isn't really that well known and isn't so enforced with my brand, then maybe I would have said yes to that opportunity. But at that time, I didn't want to take my number one bestseller and then immediately put it at that Walmart level because when it does get, you know, at that level with trends, that's kind of the, you know, the natural progression of trends. You know, it starts out high couture and runway and then it kind of trickles down to the masses through, you know, Target and then from there it goes down and down and down. And so I felt like if I would have agreed to that licensing opportunity, it would have just nosedived that one piece and it would have lost a lot of its potential. And, you know, still it's, it's in my top five bestsellers. So I'm glad I didn't just, and they also wanted exclusivity, which is a hard thing for me to give away. What was the moment you were most proud of all this? I mean, and this is a weird question, but also like, did your parents think that this move was a responsible one or people in your life back home when you first took off? Did they think this was a good thing for you? So I just went to a friend's wedding back in Kansas City last Thanksgiving. You know, a friend of a friend, someone that I knew from high school, they asked one of my good friends when I was going to be serious about life and stop backpacking. Like they thought I've just been backpacking for five years. <laughs> I think that, that that notion does cross people's minds when I tell them, oh, I'm an artist and I travel the world and I don't have a permanent home. You know, I think people can automatically put me in a box just hearing that. But, you know, there really is a lot more to it. You know, I think my proudest moment, it wasn't even within creating my own artwork. I started 
teaching some online classes through a platform called Skillshare. And it was, it's, I, I teach some online classes that are basically entrepreneurial skills for creatives. So it's classes about how to get started in art licensing or, you know, that covers things like how to, you know, make sure you're not getting screwed over with contracts or how to get started with these opportunities. And the first class I ever did, I had no intention of ever teaching a class ever. It was not something that I ever appealed to me. I didn't think I would be good at it. But Society6 asked if I wanted to teach a class on their behalf in partnership with Skillshare, where they would fly me out to New York. I would just put together the curriculum. All I would have to do is just show up, talk about everything I know, and then their team would edit it all on their end and, and launch it. And I, I really didn't want to do that because I thought that uh, I really didn't think I had that much valuable information to share, which looking back, I, I realized was a little bit naive. Also common. I have to interject. It's like whenever people say, I don't have that, this is as a conference organizer, an enormous challenge because people like you who are actually doing cool shit rarely think of themselves because you're in process. You're in a state of becoming not being expert genius cat. Instead, you're someone who's working on a day-to-day -day basis, still trying to figure out how your business is going to run. Those people are the ones that we really want to share their, their skills, right? Absolutely. And they're often the hardest people <laughs> to get because they're like, the common response I always get when people are doing really interesting things is they'll say, oh, get back to me next year. Like, I'll reach my goal then, and then I'll be willing to like, you know, share. And I'm always thinking, well, right now is where you're most interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly what I said on the, when, you know, we hopped, I hopped on that call with Society6 and they pitched me that idea. And that was my response. It was like, I think you could find someone that would do a better job than me. And they basically had to sell me on me to get me to agree to it, you know, and convince me. And after the entire experience of, you know, flying to New York, just basically sitting in front of a camera for two days and just spurting out everything that I knew about art licensing. I was so nervous in front of the camera that I feel like I just, I would go back to my hotel every night and just think like, I think I just blacked out. Like, I don't even remember what I said. It was just, I was so nervous. But then I saw the final piece that they cut together. They sent it to me. Um, we did some back and forth on edits. And it was, I was like, wow, that, that actually came together really well. And it's a lot of really helpful, valuable information just, you know, condensed in this one 30 minute course. And they, they launched it. I did that essentially pro bono. It was a favor to Society6 since they're the ones that really kickstarted my career. But what that did essentially was build up this audience of students that were following me on that platform Skillshare just because that one class had been uploaded. And at one point I realized I was sitting on, you know, 20,000 students on Skillshare that had, you know, followed me just because of that one class existing. Wow. And I realized that, you know, I was basically sitting on this this really good opportunity of as much as I hate being in front of a camera and, and staring at a camera and talking and then having to edit it and listen to myself talk, like as horrible as that is, it was a good opportunity to help other creatives that were in the same position that I was just a few years prior. So the way that I, you know, I, I launched a second class after that, talking about how I scan my work into Photoshop and clean it up and then get it ready for art licensing opportunities and how I set it to templates. And then I've done a few other entrepreneur classes. And, you know, each time I launch a new class, my audience is I'm talking to myself five years ago. So it's everything that I didn't know that I had to learn the hard way. And it's it's been really helpful. So I guess, you know, circling back to the thing that I've been the most proud of in my career, it's being able to, you know, reach this massive audience of people that are aspiring to to do what I do and hopefully help them along the way. I think that's like the theme of this show is like, if you're running a business online, like you've really stumbled onto something magical. I mean, I don't know what your motivations were at the beginning to start going to business conferences, but I think a lot of people feel like they first go for a variety of reasons, but I hope that like, at least at the DC conferences, people start to see like, wait a second, like I have just as much to contribute as everybody else here, you know, just because I'm doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember my first DC conference, I went to DC BKK a few years ago. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, no, no one's going to respect me. I'm an artist. I'm showing up at this entrepreneur conference. It's all of these really established entrepreneurs. But yeah, it was, it was incredibly accepting. And as soon as, you know, I started talking about what I do and what, you know, licensing your intellectual property is all about and how I've been able to monetize that, you know, not just into a sufficient income, but a primarily passive and recurring income. I was able to swap a lot of ideas back and forth with a lot of other entrepreneurs that I met there. And, you know, this kind of 
insecurity I had about going into that being an artist was, you know, just squashed within the first five minutes. I also feel like a lot of people get into entrepreneurship, not because they're interested in being a business person per se, but because they are creative. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of business strategy is just creative problem solving and it's thinking outside the box. Totally. Kat, the hardest question is the last one, which is, you know, what's your general advice for people listening to this show that want to do something on their own and they want to have more flexibility and freedom in their lives? Like what, what sort of things do you share with people that ask you those questions? I think my biggest piece of advice is that, you know, something that feels like a really, really big deal today is just going to be a, a blip in the long term of things. I look back to the amount of anxiety I had over quitting my job and pursuing this full time. And I mean, I wasn't sleeping. I could barely eat. Like I was just, I was so, so nervous. But I look back on that and I think like, damn, I should have, I should have quit a year before I actually did. But I, I didn't have the confidence to do that. I didn't have that belief in myself that I could actually make this into a sustainable career for myself. Any decision you make isn't the end all be all. And if it does turn out to be a wrong decision, like there's always, you know, ways to maneuver around that. So, you know, back when I was getting started, a lot of decisions I made, it was so much stress just behind making that decision. But looking back, it's, you know, it was the right decision to make. But even if it didn't work out, I could always get, um, you know, another job at a different agency. I think that's my biggest, my biggest piece of advice is, thinking more in terms of big picture and not getting so bogged down with the day-to-day decisions that you need to make. Kat, thanks for joining us on the show. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate it. First off, big ups to Kat for swinging by the show. Absolutely love this conversation, Ian. I love thinking about how you can go to your work shed, you can create art, and you can make money off it. It gets me totally jacked. If you want to check out some of Kat's artwork and see links to everything we mentioned in this show, check out tropicalmba.com slash Kat Coke, and that's C-A-T-C-O-Q. And also, Kat has contributed a prize. We talked about prizes at the top. Did I mention that we have a Tropical MBA survey? If I fill out the survey twice, does that mean I'm twice as likely to win a prize? You are disbarred. You are not allowed to win a prize, boss man. TropicalMBA.com slash survey. You are eligible, dear listener, to win a prize on behalf of the boss man and some many wonderful sponsor companies, including today's guest, Kat Coke. So many things I find inspiring in this interview, Ian. First off, I love Kat's send away message, which is in TMBA parlance. What you're struggling with on your desk right now, what you're hoping for, that big thing in your business, it's just another Wednesday. And you're going to find out more about your potential and your business future if you make those decisions faster and increase the velocity. The other thing that stuck out to me, Ian, is I just, you know, as a former struggling artist myself, and I would say like an artistic martyr in many different ways, like I always wanted to be a creative person. And in some ways, like, It's easy as a creative person to like hide yourself away from the world and feel special because you know about creativity. It's like a way to make yourself feel good about poor prospects in life sometimes. And what Kat has done is something braver than what I did when I was an artist, which she put her work in front of people and she calibrated to it. And she said, I'm willing to to serve these people with my art. Mm -hmm. and find an overlap between what creatively drives me and what other people love. And it turns into this incredible force of momentum and feedback loop where now she's getting paid to grow her skill set as an artist. It's incredible. To be a little bit more specific about what you're talking about here is I think she created a process and a product around her artwork. And that's enabling her to continue to be an artist. So She said, I want to do my work in front of other people. And also, here's the products that I think are relevant to my artwork. And because she put that on display and because she put that on sale and because it's been wildly popular, now she has the ability, even more so than in the beginning, to smoke thin cigarettes (laughs) and do art, which is amazing, which is exactly what you want. But she had to put herself out there. She had to 
And there's not even a risk part here. She had to just put herself out there. The the thing I was about to say would be like, and risk it, right? What's the risk? The risk that you make money? The risk that you sell out to Target? Like, what an amazing opportunity. So many artists, your creativity is something you reserve for yourself. And it's a way that, personally, I'll speak for myself. It's a way that you can feel good about yourself when other things aren't going well. And, you know, five, 10 years from now, if Kat stays on this path, she could just do like the most obnoxious installation pieces. Exactly. (laughs) If you start with the arrogance, you're not going to get very far. What I love about Kat's art is that she was humble in that way and she was willing to put it in front of people and willing to do things that they want as well. And that feels like it's earned her a lot of power in the choices she can make both artistically and certainly from a lifestyle perspective. You know, Kat's one of my favorite follows on Instagram. She's able to travel full time and that travel actually contributes to her art, which I think is is just magical. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Well, boss man, time to get back to the literal and figurative drawing board. We've got some creativity of our own to get to today. Thanks for joining me. As always, we will be back next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Did I mention we have a survey of a tropical? Did I <laughs> Three <laughs> times I can I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm sorry. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.